a native of Sharpsburg, Kentucky, Captain Edward O. Garant was a favored son of the bluegrass country. He was a bright, handsome young man, Chesterfieldian in manner, possessing wondrous fluency of speech. Although a small man, his was a conspicuous figure in any assemblage. Polite as the politest Frenchman, gentle and refined, he was a superb cavalier. Seemingly without effort, Captain Garant was always faultlessly, not to say fastidiously, attired, no matter what the conditions. He served during the war as a staff officer, performing the duties of Adjutant General for General Marshall, General Williams, General Cosby, and Colonel Giltner, Army of the Confederate States of America. This is his story, in his own words. I am now teaching at Flat Creek. This is my third session, commenced November 11th, 1861. Now have 25 scholars, the first session I ever taught in winter. On Christmas Day, 250 of Colonel Wolford's Federal Cavalry arrived at Sharpsburg on its way to the mountains in search of a gang of rebels that has been marauding through the country. Captain Bob Stoner, Peter Everett, and Jimmy Young have all been down lately from the camp of the cavalry now at West Liberty. The infantry, 2,000, with four cannon, are now encamped at Paintville on the Big Sandy River under General Humphrey Marshall. My departure for the Army. After mature consideration and consulting my wishes more perhaps than my judgment and friends, I determined to try my fortunes in a new and unknown field where honor and patriotism called me, though health and friends forbid. I had everything that my heart could desire except the consciousness of not fulfilling my duty to my country. I prepared as speedily as possible. I taught my school until Thursday, January 30th, and on that morning bid my scholars all goodbye a very sorrowful task. As it was also to leave my many friends and dear family, I bid them all goodbye, for in this group are centered my highest hopes and tenderest sentiments. I hate to appear Epicurean in mentioning our fare so minutely, but cannot forbear to record the fact that our fare since we left home has consisted mainly of sauerkraut, cabbage, and sorghum molasses. For tonight, we seem to forget our toils and dangers amid the melodious notes of George Southall's voice chanting Dixie and Old Virginia. We started again on our long and wearisome journey to a camp which seems to recede as fast as we advance. Now we hear the nearest camp to be on Rock House Fork of the Kentucky River, some 70 miles away across the mountain. No Union men, Lincolnites, they call them, in this country, but found out General Marshall has moved his headquarters to Gladesville. We started early for camp and traveled down the beautiful Powell's River. About 10 a.m., after eight miles journey, we have in sight the long, long looked for, long wished for camp of the Kentucky Cavalry. The novelty of the camp being over and the joy of seeing my old acquaintances somewhat abated, I desired to return to the post where my duty called me. My friends, other friends I mean, advised me I would not survive a month's hardships and privations and exposure. As I left home under promise to my father and friends not to enlist and serve as a soldier in the field, Caution constrained me to prefer a secretary ship for which I was better fitted. Lounged around all morning, and about 1 p.m. was introduced to Brigadier General Humphrey Marshall. General Marshall's voice is very strong and coarse, rough and dictatorial in his conversation. 
He impressed me as being a man of considerable talent and decision of character. He spoke to me kindly, as he does to everyone, asked me if I desired to join the Army, to which receiving an affirmative answer, he proceeded to swear me into allegiance into the Confederate States of America. After repeating the oath after him, I was now fully inducted into office, an office of whose duties I was entirely ignorant. Awoke this morning a soldier, but did not feel any more bloodthirsty or pugilistic. Today, commenced by degrees, my duties as a copyist in the Assistant Adjutant General's office. Getting better initiated into my duties. My time entirely consumed in riding and attending to my horse, who has the scratches very bad. Bladesville in Wise County, Virginia, I forgot to mention, has nine resident families. One blacksmith, one saddle shop, a storehouse, and a large courthouse, but no church or jail. Population is about 1,000, minus 965. Getting over camp diarrhea, which somewhat debilitated me, and feeling tolerably well. Writing General Marshall's official letters in a large blank book. Also, orders, special and general, in another. Before issued, all letters, orders, and commands from the general passed directly through my hands. Reports are continually coming in regarding the approach of the enemy, etc., but not credit. Today, I most forcibly and sorrowfully realize the maxim that war has no Sabbaths, for I was unwillingly compelled by my office to write all day. The first Sabbath I ever did such a thing in my life. I hope I may obtain forgiveness for it. But we will not despair. Our cause, it is just, and in God is our trust. Fight on is our motto. Two soldiers died in the hospital today. It's a wonder they don't all die. Another died on Sunday night. He was from Fleming County, Kentucky. On coming to the adjutant office this morning, I was shocked with the sad and mournful intelligence of the fall of Fort Donaldson. With terrific slaughter on both sides, estimated a thousand on ours, and the evacuation of Bowling Green by General Johnston and the retreat of his army beyond Nashville. This day, Jefferson Davis is inaugurated president of the Confederate States of America, despite the efforts of Lincoln to prevent a partner in his office and a division of his domain. Today, the government of the Confederate States ceases to be provisional and becomes constitutional, and, I hope, stable and perpetual. Continual association with scenes of suffering, of danger, and of death is tending greatly to render me insensible to grief or compassion. Death is nothing here where so many die, and all are liable to at any moment. Suffering is disregarded where all are compelled to undergo a share. No one can imagine the wretchedness and misery to which the poor sick soldier is often exposed. In transportation, and in many of the hospitals, it seems to me I would rather die in a decent, comfortable house than to live in one of those miserable abodes of the sick. February 28th, 1862. It's my birthday. 23rd anniversary of my entrance into the world. Ah, how many reflections, melancholy and yet joyous too, does the recurrence of such a day excite? The people in this country are very much frightened and are preparing to leave before the expected invasion by the Yankees. It is likely that General Marshall will permit the Lincolnites to cross the Cumberland and fight them somewhere between the mountains and the salt works in Smythe County. General Marshall, in conjunction with General Heth, have the discretionary power of calling out the militia of 18 counties in West Virginia. 
The militia throughout other portions of the state are commanded to repair immediately to Generals Joseph E. Johnson, Magruder, Huger, and Smith. In the evening, a courier arrived from Gladesville announcing the evacuation of Pound Gap by Major Thompson's battalion. After an hour's fight yesterday morning with 2,000 Yankees, the prospects of a battle are now more favorable, though I suspect the Lincolnites contemplate no speedy movement into Virginia. At supper, General Marshall gave to Colonel Trigg and others his opinion of the officers in the Confederate service. He has not a very high opinion of the intellectual General A.S. Johnston, good opinion of General Joseph E. Johnston, thinks General Robert E. Lee, the head man in the Army, is justly entitled to the chief command of the Southern forces. Courier arrived with rather discouraging news from Stonewall Jackson's brigade in the valley, fought a severe battle, 18,000 Yankees versus 5,000 Southerners. Lost, 500 killed and fell back. April 2nd, 1862, it's a spring day, sweet day, sunny day. How can we appreciate such days? Took a notion I would embrace my opportunity in the absence of General Marshall and go to see the cavalry boys at Osborne's Ford. I arrived at Osborne's Ford where the cavalry was encamped about dusk. Here, I saw floating over Captain Cameron's quarters the first rebel flag since I've been in Dixie. The Major and the boys seemed very much delighted to see me. Most all well. The boys are living finely, especially on fish, of which they have a quantity, caught out of the Clinch River in the traps. Glorious news. Intelligence was received today of a fierce and bloody battle at Corinth, Mississippi, between the great armies under command of Generals Johnston, Bragg, Breckinridge, and Polk versus Grant and McClelland on the Federal side. The result was the entire overthrow of the Vandal hordes of Lincoln with the loss of 6,000 prisoners and 80 pieces of artillery but too dearly bought by the death of the great and gallant General Sidney Johnston. We hope this part is untrue, but alas, the information is considered reliable. Today, recorded confirmation for the glorious news from Tennessee. General Johnston certainly killed. Breckinridge distinguished himself. Enemy in flight and our soldiers in pursuit. The battle was fought on the 6th and Beauregard now in chief command. General Prentiss of the Federal Army was captured. I do hope they will run every Yankee out of Tennessee and Kentucky without giving them time to burn or plunder. Courier brought papers from Richmond and Lynchburg with further particulars of the great battle at Shiloh. Enemy retreated, led to their gunboats, and afterwards united with Buell. Not yet heard the loss on either side. Tonight is nearly as light as day. The silver moon throws a fascinating mantle over the cold, muddy earth. Ah, does this bright moonlight shine thus beautifully over the enslaved fields of my motherland, old Kentucky. Courier brought intelligence of the continuation of the great battle on the Mississippi, where they have been fighting all week. After the defeat of Grant's army of 60 to 70,000 and the junction of it and Buell's 70,000, Beauregard fell back to Corinth. There, he fought the whole combined forces of the Yankees and was there attacked by Buell. Dispatch says that the General Buell was killed result of the battle not known. General Marshall not yet returned to camp, may have gone on to Richmond. General Tom Johnson was at headquarters today. Looks rather rosy for a gray-haired man. 
afraid he likes his tea too well, studies the unhappy history of Ireland too closely. More Lincoln weather, as Major Hawes calls it, trying to rain and give the gunboats a lift, received reports of 1,200 Federals scattered up and down the Big Sandy River. This is the anniversary of the fall of Fort Sumter. Conscription bill passed Congress, putting every man in the Army between 18 and 35 years of age. It's supposed this will create an Army of 500,000. Pretty good day for Western Virginia. General Marshall received a dispatch from General Smith asking for reinforcements at Cumberland Gap, now threatened by the enemy. General replied he had no force to detach, but if necessary, he would bring his whole command if he could get into a fight. Also received the news of the capture of New Orleans by the enemy, a great blow to our cause. Oh, the rain. All day go the merciless raindrops. Colonel Lee thinks the rain will continue as long as the war. He believes it due to burning sulfur and saltpeter. May 1st, May Day. The weather celebrated by big general rain as usual. But I forgot weather when I received my first letter from home. Such a letter as only Mrs. Hamilton could write read it to all the boys, for everything is common among the soldiers. Enemy at Princeton now reported 2,500. Martial law now proclaimed over this department. Good news from the North. Contemplated withdrawal of border state men from Congress. Also reported intervention by France. Too good to be true. Troops in fine spirits at the prospect of a battle. General Williams, now at the Salt Works, ordered to move at daylight tomorrow with his command. Awaiting intelligence from General Heth, with whom we cooperate. Some 3,500 cavalry, infantry, and artillery in camp here. Virginia regiments reorganized here are now in 20 or 30 miles of the enemy, battle approaching. Camp full of bustle and excitement preparing to move. A soldier trying to escape from the guard last night killed himself by running against a post. The immediate prospect of battle renders many very weak and sickly. I see some of the largest and stoutest men looking as white as death and quivering like an aspen. To many, this is the first battle. May 16th, our day of battle. Command started early this morning for Princeton, Virginia, where we expect to meet our enemy. 17 miles to Princeton, marched all day through a wilderness almost. Our mounted pickets on the other road were fired into, but suffered no loss except in hats. The general ordered the battalion of riflemen to advance at double quick, which the boys did with a shout. We marched but a short distance now before fighting commenced. Here and now, for the first time, I heard the death song of the miniball, which whizzed all around, sometimes uncomfortably close. We drove the enemy slowly back toward the town. They fought valiantly, but could not withstand the deadly shooting and loud huzzas of our ragamuffins, who used the large Belgian rifles that sounded almost like small artillery. By the side of the road lay the gigantic corpse of a Zouave, all stark in death. The avenging ball had struck him just below the corner of the mouth and passed entirely through his head, killing him instantly. His face was nearly black when I saw it, and I hope I may never see such another sight. A little farther down lay another of our enemies wounded. Here we came to a large hill which was cleared except for a few dead trees and logs. 
Over this field lay the dead and wounded Federals, being almost exposed to the fire of our men. When the enemy was driven from the last position, they fell back toward town. The fighting commenced about 4.30 p.m. and lasted until dark. Our forces occupied the town about 11 p.m., found the charred and blackened remains of what had once apparently been a pretty little village. The troops left Princeton just at daybreak amid the tears and importunities of the women to not fight here anymore. Our forces had not been long in position west of the town when the skirmishers of the enemy dove into sight, taking position with their artillery at the old courthouse. The town was soon alive with the enemy and a force of three to 500 moved out as if to attack us and remained in the open field in full view for a half an hour. The ball opened about 9 o'clock a.m. by a cannonball over the mountain to our right behind our cavalry force. Soon after, the enemy's battery situated near the courthouse and another in a pine grove on the left of town opened fire on our battery. The noise of the cannon was terrific, but like the roar of a lion, more terrible than dangerous. I could easily see and hear the cannon shot as they came whirring over us, sometimes a hundred feet above us. Most of the shell exploded before reaching us. Many failed to go off at all. Thirty-five struck the hill we occupied. About 10 o'clock a.m., the musketry fire commenced on our right and to the rear. It soon grew fast and furious, mingled with the shouts of the combatants. The fight lasted only about 30 minutes, and it ended when about a 1,000 German Federals retreated at double quick, leaving 150 or 60 of their dead and wounded on the field. Night closed in on the two armies in sight of each other. Our men nor horses have had not anything to eat since Friday morning. Now nearly starved. Our troops slept on their arms, expecting to renew the conflict in the morning. When morning came, no enemy occupied Princeton. They had fled, taking with them all they could, but leaving us a legacy of 70 of their wounded in the hospital. 16 mules, five horses, 12 tents, 35 coils of telegraph wire, and one wagon load of wine. After gathering up the spoils, we took up the line of march back to our own district. Our whole force numbered 2,907. The least estimate of our enemy's force was 6,000. We hear that the militia of Kentucky are called out. Now let us see if Lincoln can call out men who have disregarded the call of patriotism, interest, and humanity. Today received reliable intelligence of great victory at Richmond on Saturday and Sunday last. We captured 550 prisoners and 14 pieces of artillery. Loss, 1,000. Generals Pettigrew and Hatton killed. Johnston wounded. Jeff Davis on the field. The great battle of the war going on at Richmond News up to Saturday, 6,000 prisoners and 80 to 100 cannon captured. McClellan's right wing driven round, Stonewall in his rear. July 4th, 1862, Independence Day. The friendly, happy, beauteous features of this honored day are hardly recognizable now. So marred are they by tears and blood. The great battle still in progress at Richmond. McClellan trying to make his escape to his gunboats on the James River. Hope he may not succeed. Lincoln calls out 300,000 more men. McClellan reinforced, lying at Westover under care of gunboats. General Boyle in Kentucky having a prison built at Louisville for secession women of Kentucky. Let the beast butler look to his laurels. Mediation from abroad rumored. The sword and musket are the only mediators. Mail came in this morning. 
General Buckner exchanged and general exchange of prisoners. Battle impending in Gordonsville between Pope and Jackson. Miss Belle Boyd, Jackson's celebrated spy, arrested and sent to Washington. Pope and his officers, anathemized by President Davis, won't be considered prisoners of war and they'll be hung. Petersburg threatened by McClellan. No volunteering in the North will certainly draft. Lincolnites worse than ever, arresting old and young. Jackson's force is six or 7,000. He ordered prayer and fasting yesterday. Something's up. General expecting orders from the War Department. Great expectations and suspense. Bragg and Smith moving upon Buell and Morgan. Stirring events expected soon. Lincoln, old ape, has mortally offended the Negro worshipers of the North by denying the equality of the white and black races. He has disbanded Hunter's Negro brigades. News of another great battle on the plains of Manassas between the federal forces 60,000 strong and our forces 40,000 strong under Generals Lee, Longstreet, and the gray-eyed man of destiny Thomas J. Jackson. After three days of fighting, the Vandal Army was completely overthrown. This is the first report. Hope it may all be so. Hoorah for hoorah. Twice glorious Manassas, rich with the blood of heroes and conquerors, sacred and sanctified in the memories of millions of freemen throughout the earth. Long before day this morning, the general aroused us to prepare to start. With pleasure, I hail the prospect of starting soon to God's country, on to Kentucky. Now at last, we are about to undertake our pilgrimage to the promised land through a long and arduous journey through the wilderness. General Smith writes, all Federals evacuated Kentucky. General Marshall urged to come. Captain Jenkins and I tolerably lighthearted like as if a mountain were lifted from it, and we could rise and soar away to old Kentucky. March 13 miles today. We halted for the night near the residence of one Mr. King, who has two daughters, very pretty, if they didn't chew tobacco. Such a nauseating and indecent practice is very popular in this country. All smoke, big and little, and many chew. I saw a little girl 10 years old smoking. I read to these otherwise pretty girls a lecture on tobacco chewing. Troops concentrating at Mount Sterling with intention of intercepting Morgan's retreat from Cumberland Gap. Rumored capture of Washington City. Also, universal emancipation by Lincoln. Life is a battle, another journal of war, another record of bitterness and bloodshed, another diary of battles won and lost and of thousands slain and tens of thousands wounded, another remembrance of death and darkness and crime, another remembrance of disaster and desolation, another picture of blasted hopes and ruined fortunes, of burning houses and sacked cities, a picture of woe. Another wail of lamentation from widowed hearts, from orphan children, and childless parents. Our country. In the evening, the general went up to Bryantsville to see General Bragg. I accompanied him. Saw Generals Polk, Anderson, Preston, Cheatham, and Buckner. Also, Governor Hawes and William Duke. Everybody serious enough and expressed a general disgust for Kentucky. General Preston defined the position of Kentucky as one of general sympathy and resistance. God help our native state. We came and offered her help. She refused and we go away. Now surrounded by 100,000 enemies and only 33,000 of us, 
in God is our trust. Enemy in Danville and Harrodsburg. Most of our forces concentrated around Camp Breckenridge. Bragg is a great general, I guess. But if only old Stonewall was here. Still, God is here. Stonewall's God. October 12th. A dark day, a long remembered day. Day of blasted hope and ruined fortunes. Our army unaided and unassisted by the people of the state that they came to deliver, weakened by weary marches, sickness and battle, to 33,000 stands now like a lion at bay, surrounded by 100,000 hungry minions of a ruthless despot. The conflict is unequal. The victory unworthy the sacrifice of a battle. The purpose is evacuation by Cumberland Gap. We came to meet Kentuckians with arms and doors open and welcome. We met clenched teeth and closed doors. But those we love shall never breathe the same air nor drink of the same streams that gives vitality to such Kentuckians. They will bid farewell to the skies and fields and rivers that were once beautiful in the sunlight of liberty and glorious in the consciousness of an untarnished fame to a sunnier and freer and happier climb, we will remove them and live or die free, if nothing more. Return to loyal rebel country and on to Hazel Green. Surprised very much at the no place appearance of Hazel Green. Not more than half a dozen houses in the town. Return to Holderby's battalion now camped here one and a half miles from Hazel Green. Here, Ed Sanders brought me my suit of jeans clothes presented by generous Mrs. Ellen Hamilton. God bless her forever. Enclosed was a sensible, hopeful, and patriotic note. The women of Kentucky are the only remaining diadem in the once illustrious crown of old Kentucky. May heaven preserve it with care. They deserve anything and everything. Hoorah for the women, the rebel women of my native state. I just got to the summit of the Cumberland Mountains where I am now writing this brief memoir. On the Kentucky side of the line, perhaps the last words I shall for a long time, if not forever, pen in the limits of my airing through loved Kentucky. Camp tonight at the foot of the mountain. Major Connor here, just returned from his long imprisonment, a splendid officer and gallant soldier. General J.E.B. Stewart recently made another grand round into Pennsylvania. No news from McClellan or Lee, both armies lying along the Potomac, Bragg and Richmond, Breckenridge going towards Nashville, Beauregard in command of Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Great naval expedition fitting up in the north. Destination unknown. Decreasing prospect of foreign intervention. Stonewall Jackson lately tore up 30 miles of Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Lincoln ought to issue a proclamation to have him stopped. Lincoln's proclamation, or message to Congress, published in Richmond Papers recommends gradual emancipation until one government, rather than suddenly, talks sacredly about waging a war through generations. Papers announce fighting still in progress at Fredericksburg. God defend the right. Emperor Napoleon speaks of intervening in this cruel and unnatural and unnecessary war, whether England or Russia will or will not. Telegram from Knoxville this evening announces a severe battle in progress near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Commenced yesterday. Enemy drove us 10 miles when reinforcements on our side turned the tide of battle and we are now driving them toward Nashville. Our loss, 3,000. Enemies, 5,000. We have taken 1,200 prisoners. Battle's now raging at Fredericksburg and Murfreesboro. 
All feel confident in Lee's success. We are expecting orders east or west soon. Fierce battle and glorious victory at Fredericksburg on Saturday last. Our loss, 3,000. Enemies, 3,000 killed. Terrible carnage among the abolitionists. All of their assaults repulsed and their army driven back under cover of their guns. Sunday, asked to bury their dead. No fighting yesterday. Fighting on Saturday at Fredericksburg, Murfreesboro, North Carolina, and many places around the coast. Simultaneous advance and repulse of the enemy. December 25th, 1862, a day worthy of its sacred and immortal memories. Calm, clear, sunny, smiling, autumnal day, an echo of the better land purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Happy Christmas. January 1st, all hail New Year's. May thy destiny be bright as thy birthday. Write thy name as peacemaker. Hast thou a gift in store for us, New Year? Papers contain nothing new of importance, no fighting, ergo no news. Nothing important. After this war, newspapers will not be in as great demand. The thirst for blood seems almost insatiable. President Davis issued an elegant and able message. He says this is the third and last stage of the war. First, war for the Union. Second, war for the territory conquest. Third, war for revenge. Extermination thinks this the last year of the war. Hope he may prophesy as well as he writes and fights. The general thinks that the question of a continuance of the war for any length of time will be decided between now and the middle of February. If Louis Napoleon intends interfering in our affairs, he must do it by that time or the cotton planting season of the year will be passed and not improved to the infinite distress of the world and detriment to its great powers. If nothing be done from abroad to check the infernal hate of northern fanatics, the general thinks that the future character of the war will be of the darkest hue. Fighting under the black flag by May 1st, Thaddeus Stevens proposes in Yankee Congress to raise 150 regiments of Negroes to fight against us. February 12, 1863, the anniversary of my enlistment in the service of my country. Today, one year ago, General Marshall swore me in as a soldier of the Confederate Army for 12 months. Such a year. Thaddeus Stevens' Negro Bill passed the Congress of the U.S. Eyes 88, nays 54. U.S. government will raise 150,000 Negroes to wreak their diabolical revenge on Southern homes. What says Kentucky with her proud ancestral history, her once high-born chivalry, her sympathy with struggling sisters against extermination by a cruel foe, with her industrial wealth, her 100,000 slaves, her honor, her interest, her destiny? What says Kentucky? Lynchburg papers from the 12th, legislature of Kentucky passed a bill calling out 20,000 militia to resist Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. God, if only true. March 4th, 1863. Today, Lincoln has been in office two years. Oh, what years, what ruin he has wrought. Centuries will not repair it. Only half his time expired. In the other half, he may make earth a pandemonium. I have sit for my picture. Perhaps the artist is partial. It flatters. In such a picture appears a Confederate captain and the adjutant general of the 1st Brigade Army of East Tennessee, formerly Army of Eastern Kentucky. 
on to Richmond. After crossing the Blue Ridge at a low gap, we came into the poor red fields of the real Old Dominion. The dwellings are large and unostentatious, but wear an aspect of grandeur. Crowds of Negroes swarmed over the carefully tilled fields and prepared the thin soil for future harvests. They were all polite and well-dressed and apparently happy. The following dispatch was received this morning at the War Department to President Davis. Yesterday, General Jackson penetrated to the rear of the enemy and drove him from all his positions from the wilderness to within one mile of Chancellorsville. He was engaged at the same time in front by two of Longstreet's division. Many prisoners were taken, and the enemy's loss in killed and wounded is large. This morning, the battle was renewed. He was dislodged from all his positions around Chancellorsville and driven back towards the Rappahannock over which he is now retreating. We have again to thank Almighty God for a great victory. I regret to state that General Paxton was killed, General Jackson severely, and Generals Heth and A.P. Hill slightly wounded. Signed, Robert E. Lee, Milford, May 3rd, 1863. Glorious news. All save the wounding of Stonewall Jackson and our losses. We cannot afford to lose the man of destiny, hero of the war. He has the hearts of the people more than any other man, and his presence is worth more than a host of men. Great anxiety was manifested as to the severity and character of his wound, which was somewhat quieted by subsequent intelligence to the effect that he had been shot in the left arm. An amputation had been resorted to. No further reliable intelligence was received from the battlefield today. May 15th, 1863. General Jackson is dead. Was a nation's woe ever condensed in so few words, or a people's calamity so far beyond language to express? So mighty a warrior, so daunted a spirit, so pure a patriot, and so devoted a Christian. A nation's homage lay at his feet, its honors crown his brow. Papers announced the occupation of Jackson, Mississippi by Grant in great force and his hurried evacuation after destroying much public and private property. General Johnston gone to Mississippi with reinforcements, a battle is imminent. <laughs>